Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today we're answering a viewer question because Michelle S. asks, Is it actually possible for a vice president candidate to be elected president like on Veep, or were they just making that whole thing up? The season 5 finale of HBO's Emmy award-winning comedy Veep sure seemed like a bit of a Hollywood fantasy. Through a series of wacky situations, hilarious gaffes and complicated procedures, an obscure vice presidential candidate was elected by the incumbent vice president to be the President of the United States. Seems pretty far-fetched, right? Well, actually, it's not at all. Sure, a lot of details were added for dramatic effect and comedy's sake, but in terms of how congressional procedures and rules would play out if presented with such a scenario, the show was actually quite accurate. There is, in fact, an actual chance that one of the vice presidential candidates in a given election will be elected as president. Not only that, but it's also possible that the Speaker of the House could become the President of the United States instead. So the question now becomes, how? Well, of the 538 electoral votes up for grabs, a candidate must get or exceed 270 electoral votes in order to get the presidency. So if split in half between two candidates, that's 269 per and one vote short of the magic number. Of course, it doesn't necessarily work this way. There could be a third party candidate or even a fourth party candidate that could siphon votes from the two main contenders. Actually, all the way back in 1824, this is exactly what happened. Andrew Jackson won the popular vote, the first time it had ever actually been counted, because initially certain states didn't even select their electors based on their populace's votes, but he was only able to get 99 electoral votes, which was 32 short of the majority. There were 131 electoral votes up for grabs at the time. However, there were four candidates running for president. Oddly, all of them today would be considered as coming from the same political party, the Democratic Republicans. These other people were John Quincy Adams, who got 85, William Crawford, who got 41, and Henry Clay, who had 37. There have been other elections where third-party candidates have received electoral votes, for example in 1860, 1912, and 1968. But 1824 is the only one to date that an electoral tie was produced due to third and fourth candidates. Now, if no candidate gets an electoral majority, be it with a 269 vote tie or other candidates taking votes, the election gets sent to the House of Representatives where each state delegation gets one vote. So no matter if it's California with their 53 representatives or Rhode Island with their two representatives, it is one vote per state. Now with 50 states, it is of course possible that the House of Representatives could tie in their voting, assuming there are no abstentions or faithless electors. This, of course, also depends if the House isn't heavily weighted towards one party or the other. Also, according to the Twelfth Amendment, only the top three vote-getters are considered in the House. And to make matters a bit more confusing, it wouldn't be the House that was in office when the presidential election first started in November, but the one that had actually been elected. Because the vote would not officially happen until January, when the new House is sworn in, the dynamics of the House could change, meaning there could be a swing in which one party controls it. When the 1824 election got sent to the House, shadiness definitely ensued. Since Henry Clay finished in fourth place in the electoral vote race, he was disqualified from the House vote. However, that did not stop him from having a significant influence there. Officially, Clay made it known that he agreed with Adams's nationalist agenda and hated Jackson. So he told his supporters in the House to throw their weight behind electing Adams president. When the vote came down in February of 1825, Adams won the majority of the states with 13, while Jackson got seven and Crawford got four. This shocked Jackson and his supporters, considering that he had won the popular vote as well as the Electoral College. To make matters even more hard to stomach for Jackson, Adams quickly named Clay his Secretary of State, fanning the flames of conspiracy that this was a corrupt bargain. Livid, Jackson responded with harsh words. The Judas of the West has closed the contract and will receive the 30 pieces of silver. Was there ever witnessed such a bare-faced corruption in any country before? Now, as previously stated, it is possible for the House's voting to end in a tie. If that is the case, then the Vice President would become the President of the United States. But there is a rub. It wouldn't be the incumbent VP, but the one that the Senate has elected. In the 1800 election, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied in the Electoral College for the presidency. At the time, the second-place vote-getter would be the vice president, there was not a separate vote for that office. 
However, while campaigning, the idea was that Jefferson would be the president and Burr would be his VP. A series of votes and threats of militia marching on the Capitol resulted in Jefferson ultimately getting elected president and Burr being his VP. As a result of this mess, a few years later, the Twelfth Amendment was passed and called for separate voting designation for each position. It also gave the Senate the power to elect the vice president in a separate election, which means that if the House does end up electing a president, the Senate can elect a vice president that's from a different party. But if the House is deadlocked in its selection of a president, the Senate's choice for the VP would become president. However, this is highly contingent of what party controls the Senate after the election. OK, so what would happen if the Senate is also unable to come to a majority vote? Well, in theory, the incumbent VP is supposed to have the tie-breaking event due to being president of the Senate. With each state voting, that would be 26 to 25 in favor of whoever the VP picks. Now, a state or several states could abstain from voting, which would completely alter the outcome. If an abstaining state prevents the VP vote being the deciding one, then the presidency goes to the Speaker of the House. To attempt to make that jumble of a mess a little more clear, here's a potential scenario for something like this happening with the previous 2016 election. Let's say Clinton and Trump had ended up tied with 269 electoral votes each. Now the decision would go to the House of Representatives in January to be determined by the recently elected Congress. If that ends up in a tie, then the Senate would choose between the VP candidates Tim Kaine and Mike Pence. Now, if a state ends up abstaining and turns incumbent VP Joe Biden's vote into the one tying instead of the tiebreaker, it would have made the then current Speaker of the House President of the United States. It is also possible that both the House and the Senate elect their respective officers, but they end up being from different parties. This means, for example, you could have gotten a Clinton Pence or a Trump Kane White House. So, I really hope you enjoyed that video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got another channel, it's called Biographics. It's biographies of notable people from the present day as well as history, from Elon Musk to Osama bin Laden. Check it out through the icon on the screen now. But if you want to watch something else right now, why not check out another Today I Found Out video or a Biographics video over there on the right? And as always, thank you for watching.